an older guy. And he does. He does. Good morning, church. Good morning. We're so glad that you're here. Will you stand? Let's sing as we have come into his house. We uh, are here to praise the Lord Most High. Let's sing to his name. as I should learn to change my sorrow into bliss. No rest till he had plans to bring me nigh. How wonderful is love like this. Such love, such love, such wondrous love, such love, such love, such wondrous love that God should love us sinners such as Oh, 
with us again. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Yeah. 
It's important to put God in his proper place as we come into this place. That we understand that we're not even, we're not even giving him breath that's ours. But instead we do what we do in this sanctuary. We pour out a gift that he's already given us, this very life. We give it back to him. Yes. So we're going to sing that chorus one more time together. And just... Give it all, give it all to him. Cause it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. You Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writes this. It says, As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. That is the calling of all the saints. It says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body. One spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. As you greet each other this morning with the love of Christ, remember that. He is the one who is uniting us together as one body, one faith, one baptism. Find someone. Would you share that love with them today? Shake their hand. Make them feel welcome this morning as we go into our announcements.
right, very good. Well, good morning. Unruly mob of uh, Louisville Grace community. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, we're so glad that you're here this morning. It sounds like you're glad to see each other this morning as well. And so it's, uh, it's a great morning to be in the house of the Lord. I wanted to, uh, uh, first of all, uh, introduce myself. I'm Pastor Daniel. You're here at Louisville Grace Community Church of the Nazarene. We're glad that you've joined us this morning, that you're in this place. Or, uh, of course, we are um, live streaming our services every morning on our website at lgcnaz.com and also on our Facebook page. And so you may be watching us uh, and you're not in the building with us. We want to give you our special welcome as well. Uh, sometimes I like to say, hi, Mom. So, hi, Mom. Uh, glad that you're watching today. And... Um, uh, just a, a great time to be here. If you're on Facebook, you can actually leave messages for us. You can leave messages, prayer requests, amens, uh, snide remarks. We'll probably delete those, but you can put them on for now and there's nothing we can do about it. So uh, go ahead and leave those there. I wanted to share a couple of announcements with you as well. Um, the first one is, uh, I just want to let you know our, our Wednesday service this week, because it's the first Wednesday uh, of the month, is our mission service. And part of that will be um, a special guest by the name of Lisa Steen. And she is going to be helping us uh, with some ideas for what to do with our uh, Operation Christmas Child boxes. If you've uh, gotten one of those boxes, she's going to help uh, show how to pack those. And also share a little bit of what actually happened. She has, uh, she, she took a trip to South Africa to deliver these boxes at one point. And uh, I think I said this last week, this may be the best present that some of these kids ever get. And yeah. so uh, you want to see what happens with Operation Christmas Child boxes. You don't want to miss this Wednesday. And, um, and of course, Tara always has something wonderful prepared for us on that night as well. So uh, welcome you to a Wednesday night service. That'll be at um, 7 o'clock. Yeah, 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. I always get my 6s and my 7s mixed up. I had to look at you. Yeah, it's a 6 or 7. Okay, yeah. It's always a 7 o'clock. I have a little calendar I can refer to during the week, but I'm not in front of it. Anyway, um, also wanted to invite you... Uh, uh, we normally have our, our uh, second Tuesday of the month dinners, uh, and we enjoy those. We have a Thanksgiving-themed one this time because it's second November, Tuesday. and so uh, we'll provide uh, a little bit of uh, turkey and, and meat and all that kind of stuff, but we would ask that you would bring your typical Thanksgiving, your traditional side, some of your favorite dishes uh, that you've had in Thanksgiving, and we're going to enjoy a fantastic meal together on the 10th. And so uh, go ahead and schedule that. That'll happen right after service. Okay. And so. Did I say Tuesday? Not Tuesday. Don't come here Tuesday with Thanksgiving food. Did I really say Tuesday? Okay, so yeah, if you're watching online, Sunday, after service, you're going to have to come here to participate. So that's good. Anyway, thank you so much for helping me correct that. That will be Sunday, November 10th. Uh, wow, there's a lot of stuff going on. Tuesday, go out and vote or something, okay? Do that on Tuesday. That'll be good. Um, other than that, man, we're just, we're so excited uh, to be part of what's going on here. I love the spirit in this church, and God is with us today. We're yeah. going to continue to uh, to sing and praise Him. We're going to praise Him even in our tithes and our offerings. And so I'm going to uh, ask our ushers to come forward this morning, and, and um, we're going to pray for those as well, remembering that God... <laughs> we already sang about it. He's given us the very breath that we breathe, and He's yes. given us everything else Amen. as well. And so we, uh, we participate in worship by giving Him what He's asked and doing it with, um, uh, honestly, in obedience and in surrender and in pure joy. And so may this be an act of pure joy as well. Lord, we are here this morning, and we give everything to You. Yes. You've given us resources. You've given us a voice. You've given us time. You've given us family. You've given us so much, Lord. And so everything we lay back at your feet. So bless this giving of these tithes and these offerings. May they be uh, just another, another wonderful part of our worship. Yes. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Yes. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. 
In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I cannot see you with my eyes, let faith arise to you. When I cannot feel your hand in mine, let faith arise to you. God of mercy and love, I will praise you, Lord. Oh, you shine with glory, Lord of life, I feel alive with you. In your presence now I come alive, I am alive with you. There is strength when I say, I will praise you, Lord. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. sorrow comes my way you are the shield around me always you remain my courage in the fight i hear you call my name jesus i am coming walking on the ways reaching for your life the joy of the lord is my strength the joy of the lord is my strength in the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. Now would you stand? Let's continue to praise his name. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Trust in Jesus, just from sin and sin. 
good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you Father, we praise you because of how good you are to yes, us. Lord. Thank you, God. God, we understand that your faithfulness, it transcends circumstance because we always know that your eye is on us no matter what yes. we're going through, no matter what we experience, God. You, God. you brought us to this day. You brought us to a new day, a chance to praise you anew, a chance to love you, a chance to hear from you. God, you've afforded us so many freedoms and so many privileges. We just want to pour ourselves out to you yes, today. Lord, praise you. As we go into the message this morning, Blessing, Lord. God, would you open our hearts, would you open our, you, our minds and our ears, and Lord, would you speak more deeply than anyone up in a pulpit could possibly think to. Yes, God. We love you. Yes. We are yours. We are your children. Be with us today. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's always a privilege to be up in the pulpit, always a privilege to speak from his word and the prayer that I just prayed. I, I truly mean it. I, 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 don't want, I don't want you to hear me today. If all you heard was me preach, then I've done it wrong or we've received it wrong. This is an opportunity for us to read from the word of God and to, and to truly hear from his voice. And so um, we're going to uh, have our Bibles at least ready in 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm in the middle of a series called A Matter of Tim. And and uh, he's already spoken some pretty great things to us through this. And uh, last week was what you may call a, a controversial topic, but one that is worthy of discussion because I truly believe that, that God has called um, everyone, male or female, whoever you may be, he's given them a voice and he's given them a mission and he's given everyone uh, a testimony to give. And uh, God has empowered people of, of all kinds in order to give his message. And so it may not be a controversial message to the world, but there is still some controversy in the church that I just don't honestly understand. But I want you to know that God, if God has given you a message, that doesn't matter who you are, you can proclaim it, and you can proclaim it in His power and in His might. This week we move on a little bit uh, beyond that because uh, uh, Paul is actually, he's, he's giving advice to Timothy on what kind of leadership should emerge in the church, what it looks like to be a leader. And uh, I, I really appreciate this. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm going to start this, actually I'm going to change the gears on you for just a moment. Uh, because before I wanted to be uh, a pastor, before I, well, I, really it wasn't before I wanted, it was before God told me I was going to be one. It wasn't something that I would have chosen for myself. But before I knew that God had placed a call in my life uh, to ministry, one of the things that I wanted to do more than anything was I wanted to fly. I wanted to be an airplane pilot of some kind. I thought about joining the Civil Air Patrol and sort of segueing into the Air Force and becoming a I don't know, a fighter pilot or something like that. You know, you, you get these grandiose dreams. Now, my eyesight's terrible. There's no way I could have ever made it into the Air Force as a pilot. But I could still dream, and I could still think about it. And I still always count it a privilege when my family is able to fly somewhere. I mean, I've been on several airplanes now in my lifetime, probably not more than I can count on my hand, but enough. And, but it's always one of those things. You get on one, it's, woo, it's this neat feeling. You feel yourself go up, and I always want to look out the window and say, look, we're flying, you know, it's that kind of thing. Man, what a privilege it is. 
I will say when we're looking for tickets, we're usually looking for the cheapest tickets available because it's not a it's not an inexpensive way to get around. But others, when they're looking for tickets, you know, they get on flights and all those kinds of things. They're looking for quality, looking for convenience. They're looking for one who has that destination, uh, has a hub in that city or something like that. Last year, my family flew on vacation and we were looking at tickets and there were a couple of decent options out there. Um, there's one that we went with. We went with the like rock bottom cheapest cost, but there were a couple of decent ones out there. One of them was from a pretty well known company, one that kind of pops in your head, maybe one of the first two airlines you think of as you're, as you're uh, thinking through, um, you know, well-known brands or recognized brands or respected brands. And I was considering going with them, but it was kind of funny. It was about the time I was starting to compare prices and thinking about maybe going with one of these um, more respected or more established brands, that a little song started going through my head. You know how music is. Uh, sometimes you get a little ditty in my head, and I'd heard this song. It was probably, I looked at it, it was 10 years ago I'd heard this song, and really it kind of popped in my head. I can't believe it was 10 years ago because it feels like two or three. But it was a video that I'd seen years before that started to come to my mind, and it popped up, and believe it or not, it had some sway in the decision for who I was going to go with with an airline. I have a little video clip I'm going to show you in just a second. Um, but there's a, there was a country artist, he's actually a Canadian country artist, I didn't even know those existed, but, um, but he made a video that, that saw about 20 million hits about 10 years ago about his experience with an airline. I'll give you a verse and a chorus, maybe a bridge from that one real quick if you want to play it. Yeah. When we landed in Nebraska, I confirmed what I suspected. Mike Taylor had been the victim of a vicious act of malice at all. So began a year-long saga of past the buck, don't ask me, and I'm sorry, sir, your claim can go nowhere. So do all the airlines people from New York to New Delhi, including kind Miss Earlwig, who says the final word from them is no. And I've chased your wild gooses And this attitude of yours I say must go United Cause United breaks guitars Well I won't say that I'll never fly with you again Cause maybe to save the world I probably would But that won't likely happen And if it did I wouldn't bring my luggage Cause you'd just go and break it Into a thousand pieces Just like you broke my heart As a guitar player, this has a lot of sway on me. <laughs> in his dissatisfaction, it's actually kind of an interesting story because he used his experience. He said that they'd basically seen him just, just tossing their instruments, the whole band just tossing them into the luggage uh, carrier, and he found that his guitar had been uh, broken because it had been so badly mishandled by the airline at that point. And he said he'd been trying to uh, try to get them to rectify it for about a year, and and uh, they didn't want to take any responsibility, and so he wrote his dissatisfaction in a song, and it's pretty catchy, too, and it ended up getting uh, quite a bit of traction uh, when it was first written, and I was reading up on it. United's stock, actually, after the emergence of this song, for about a year, started to fall and fall and fall. Now, they've recovered since then, but it had a pretty big impact on them for about a year, and a lot of people had seen this video, so it was kind of interesting. United Airlines had been a powerhouse airline for nearly a century, with a state-of-the-art fleet hubs to just about any place you want to go and healthy profits all the way, yet when this video was released again, 
they saw their profits take a dip. And it's so interesting how one person's story can change so much uh, about a company. And it's an interesting case because on one hand, United Airlines had everything, all the bells and whistles. They have the best of planes, the, the finest pilots. They had a, uh, what, let's say it was probably the, the most modern fleet uh, at the time, and they still have a very modern fleet, upscale, all these kind of things. They had f faithful clientele, uh, the largest availability of passenger flights in the world. Now, there's others that have more uh, freight flights and all that, but they had the largest availability of you and me, just people flying to places in the entire world, and yet one essential truth really hurt their reputation. See, those that represent and lead and speak on your behalf of your organization speak way louder than any feature that a company can offer. Companies, corporations, congregations <laughs> are made out of people. They are led by people, and those that represent them speak volumes about who they are. So I ask you this to begin. Are we worthy of people's time? When they walk away from a conversation with us, are they disgusted or are they frustrated? Do they ever want to interact with you again? Do you have their attention? Have we earned their respect? It's a question to ask. In Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul begins to share about what the qualities and the qualifications will be for those who seek leadership in the church, for those who are tasked to leadership in the church, about those who share a unique responsibility in leading the ambassadorship of Christ from the fold and then out into the world. And he begins with the unique qualifications of what we call a, an overseer or an elder uh, in the church. And we'll get into that for just a moment. But we're going to read together the, the first seven verses of chapter 3. So Paul says this, he says, Here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. And he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Now the word that for an overseer uh, is this word uh, um, uh, presbyteros, which means elder. It means someone who is respected or aged or has sort of emerged as a, a voice in a community. It is interchangeable with the word episkopos, which is really what we would call a bishop or a superintendent. Uh, official position of power in a church. And those two uh, in, this, in this scripture, especially in Paul's day and age, are interchangeable. They mean practically the same thing. So you could call them an elder. You could call them a pastor. You could call them a, um, a, you name it, someone who's basically in charge of the leadership of an entire congregation or a flock of people. And so that, that's really the qualifications that Paul is laying out for someone who would be in, in my position here today with what I'm doing with you. And so... Uh, that's why uh, those, by the way, who are called into lead pastorship, into a preaching ministry in the Church of the Nazarene, we call them ordained elders. Same idea, same concept. You'll actually see elder in some of the translations uh, of the Bible here, but it says overseer in the New International Version. They were responsible for shepherding. They were responsible for teaching and preaching and connection. And Paul rolls out this, this incredible deal of qualifications which the elder must possess. I do, however, find it zero mistake that the very first qualification that Paul lays out is that the overseer or the elder is to be above reproach. Above reproach, well, what does that even mean? I think it means everything, by the way. 
that the elder, the one who represents Christ, the one who represents Christ to a community of Christ followers must be above reproach. Uh, the, the word is, uh, boy, I, I'm going to, you know what, I'm not going to try to pronounce it in the Greek, but it's uh, basically, if you want to get down to the, to the root of what it means, it means to be above or beyond criticism. That someone can look at the things that you do and they cannot find fault. And it doesn't matter whether or not you are guilty or not. Can someone look at your life and even assume that there may be something that is critical of your life that they could take and say, that is not someone that I want to follow. So he says uh, that, that it's, uh, the, the elder or the leader of the church is to be above reproach. They're not even supposed to have an appearance of evil or an appearance of sinfulness or an appearance that there may be something off with their life that doesn't match with what they preach, that doesn't match what their character is, that doesn't match what their testimony is. If they can look at you, and even if you're not doing anything wrong, think <laughs> that you're doing wrong. You've already maybe caused a brother or sister to stumble. Or someone who thought you were one thing to think that you're another. See, this is so far beyond making sure that the believer toes the line between right and wrong. You know why? Because that is, when you're thinking about whether what I am doing is right or wrong, you're focused here. Am I doing right? Am I doing wrong? Paul says if you want to be a leader in the church, if you want to, to assume leadership or, or to have authority in the church, if you want uh, the respect of your people, it takes it a step further. A moral person's concern with themselves, whether they're right or wrong, but one above reproach looks to how others might perceive an action, whether it is right or wrong. Billy Graham was a master of this, by the way fantastic with this. One of the things with Billy Graham is uh, he made sure that uh, he, he would never be behind closed doors with any woman who is not his wife. Not because he thought of women as less than him or because he thought that uh, there, there was some sort of inequality, but because he wanted to make sure that there could be no mistake, that there was nothing going on behind the scenes that could be criticized of him. A lot of people did criticize him for it, thinking that he didn't see women as equal, but he wanted to make sure that no one could say he was unfaithful to his wife. Because what actually happened didn't matter if it had the appearance of impropriety. See, it was outwardly focused. It was others focused. And it is this idea of being above, above reproach that one who is a minister, one who is an elder, one who is representing the church must possess. Another qualification, by the way, you maybe heard this in the description, not someone who's not given over to drunkenness, I think is a perfect example here. Okay. Now, drunkenness on its own causes all kinds of terrible decisions, right? I think that we can all agree on that. Even people that are like, I like drinking, that kind of stuff. I, let me tell you, you have too much in you, you're going to make bad decisions. I think that's common knowledge uh, among everyone. You just don't make good decisions. But what does it mean to be above reproach in this? That's, that's another question. You sort of put those two things together. One of those things that Paul brought in the message, what does it mean when you take this and you say, I want to be above reproach? Can I tell you, this is one reason I love the church, the Nazarene. I love the principles upon which they stand, uh, because I think they understand that people have a liberty to do certain things, but liberty is not always beneficial. See, we're, we're a dry, if you don't know this, may, maybe some of you do, maybe some of you don't, we are a dry denomination. We, uh, we as, a, as a church, as a, as a denomination, we say we're going to abstain from drinking alcohol. Why? Because we're sticks in the muds, we're fuddy-duddies, we don't want anyone to have fun? No, that's not what it is. But it is in our manual that to be, um, uh, to be in line with the teachings and, and, the, and uh, the, uh, all of that with the Church of the Nazarene, we abstain from drinking alcohol. Why? Is it a sin? Well, Jesus drank wine. Ooh, okay, so it's not a sin. <laughs> he drank wine in a culture filled with wine. It would be hard to call it a sin, as we saw our Savior do it, but alcoholism, can I tell you right now, in our society is a huge, huge issue. It can cause people to do all kinds of things that they wouldn't do with the right mind. Some people might be able to get away with it and just be silly, but there's a lot of families that are torn apart by alcoholism, and it's hard to see that these things take place. Now, here's the thing, to abstain, 
to abstain from drinking of alcohol, which has the potential to do these things, especially as someone who represents the church, someone who is a voice and a face of the church, someone who stands and says, yes, I am an ambassador of the church of the Nazarene, or I am an ambassador of the church, capital C. To abstain is to have regard for both how we are perceived, who sees us doing these things, is that something that a person of Christian character should do, and also it is mindfulness for those who struggle with that very thing, saying, I don't want my brother or sister who's trying to stop and can't to see a brother or sister doing this kind of thing and allowing that, that sort of to be a shoehorn back into that lifestyle. To abstain is more than anything to be above reproach. That no one could even accuse you of having done wrong or thought of these kinds of things. No one can accuse a leader who is 100% verifiably sober <laughs> with no room for misinterpretation, can I tell you that right now? Now, along with qualifications for the elder, which Paul sort of laid out here in this, what we would likely call the lead pastor today, Paul rolls out an additional set of qualifications that characterize deacons or de and deaconesses. Some translations may say women or wives, but he lumps these together as people who are in positions of authority or positions of leadership. And so that may end up being deacons' wives. It may also be women who are ordained as deacons themselves or set in positions of service. So he says this too. Deacons too, they were called into service in the church, but usually as a support to the elder. They were often responsible for such things as collecting and distributing to the poor. But these two were positions to which one was appointed and designated as a representative of the church. Again, you're representing Jesus. You're representing the things that, that He does. You're representing His people. You're a voice. You're a respected leader. You're, you're one of those that we recognize as a leader in the church. They're an important voice. And so Paul says this about deacons and deaconesses, or deacons and, and their wives. He says this starting with verse 8. He says, In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect. There's that word again, worthy of respect. He said that the first time, didn't he? Deacons are to be worthy of respect. Sincere not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of faith, of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women, or the deaconesses, or the wives, are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household as well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. So, there have been a lot of qualifications that have been rolled out for elders, deacons, all of these things together. Let's just quickly examine each character quality together as we kind of go through this before we really, I think, get to the heart of Paul's teaching, okay? So we already discussed what it means to be above reproach, what it means to not be given over to drunkenness. And here are some additional elder characteristics or, uh, you know, um, elder bishop, whatever you want to call it. Uh, an elder needs to be a sound teacher in that what is proclaimed as fact should actually, in fact, be true and well-researched. <laughs> that's, that's very important. That's a great quality for someone who is a voice of the church to have. An elder should be hospitable. It's not enough to be smart, but to actually care about the people that you're over, the people that are under your care. You actually care for them. What a novel concept. We don't need theologians in the pulpit. We need shepherds. We need teachers. We need people who care about their flock. And I feel like sometimes that can be left lacking in the church. An elder should be self-controlled. It is so easy to lose your credibility if you fly off the handle at the lightest bit of resistance. Self-controlled. Not a recent convert. Someone once told me to never trust a leader who doesn't have a limp. Now, I, I, sometimes I have a physical limp. I've got an issue that I'm dealing with a little bit. I don't think that's what he's talking about. But never trust someone who hasn't already, never follow a leader who hasn't actually blazed the trail themselves. You know what I mean? And so you want someone who's got experience, who has been through these kinds of things. So one who takes leadership in the church is tasked with leading others down a path that they too have walked and weathered. 
It's wise advice. So Paul has that there. And to have a good reputation in the community. We'll get to the respect part of that here shortly. Then he has some characteristics that are shared between elders and deacons and deaconesses and all these things. For one, they need to be faithful to their spouse. Whew, okay. Listen, fidelity is a covenant. The marriage is a covenant. It is, a, it is more than a promise. It is this unbreakable seal almost that you make between uh, your husband and your wife, between a leader in a covenant with the church if they're not keeping their covenant with their spouse. Right? Seems pretty standard. A faithful manager of their family. I have been told many times that your family is your first flock, and it makes sense. They're perhaps a greatest reflection of a ministry. Sincerity and honesty. Pretty self-explanatory. If you're a liar, people aren't going <laughs> to... Well, they're not going to listen to you. That's just, that's just the truth. Temperate. An extremist, a hothead, an inflammatory leader, a representative invites unnecessary conflict. Unnecessary conflict. Sometimes conflict is necessary. But someone who is not temperate, someone who is not level-headed, again, will begin to take offense to things and begin to absorb things that people say. And, and after a while, they'll start to boil over when things are unnecessary. It is possible, let me tell you this, and this is not just a, an elder or a deacon kind of thing. It is possible <laughs> to be firm on an issue to have an unchangeable stance on an issue and still be temperate, to still be kind while you are standing firm in what you believe. I think somehow the church on a large scale has really, really missed this. You can have some really firm beliefs on things and not beat people in the face with what you believe. Leaders should be temperate. But then... And this is, this is really where I think Paul is getting to the heart of what he's saying here. So if you've been tuning out thus far, now it's time to tune back in, okay? <laughs> there is one that Paul mentions three times in this small text. Three different times for three different kinds of leaders. And I think that Paul really wants us to get this one, okay? So if you're writing it down... He mentions three times in this small text, whatever you do, present yourself as worthy of respect. Presents yourself as worthy of respect. And that one really gets me because I look at all of the other characteristics that we've just gone through. All of the other things that should mark someone who is representing Christ to a people or a community and all these kinds of things. Everything else that Paul has mentioned is a character trait. Something you possess, something you do, something that you take on to yourself and exude to other people. But this one is not. What, they are things that you can do and be, but respect, respect is earned. Respect is something that others give to you, and you cannot get respect other than earning it. You cannot force respect. You may be able to force compliance, but you cannot force respect on a people or a community. It is something that is earned and it is something that people do not give to you easily and it is something that is to be wielded carefully in a group of people. Respect is earned. And this is Paul's greatest push, I believe, in this entire chapter in why the leader must possess these kinds of qualities because this is how you earn people's respect. You take on these things and you must be above reproach. Don't give them a reason to cut you down because people will look for a reason to cut you down. Be above reproach. Be kind. Be gentle. Be firm. But always have others in mind in the things that you do. And I think this entirety, entirely frames the rest of this. To be worthy of respect. Are we living lives that are worthy of of respect. That's a question we need to ask ourselves here. We can't force respect on anyone. We cannot claim to be an authority, by the way, if we're not a church that is under His authority. We cannot, again, we can't coerce respect, and we can't even claim to have the authority unless we're operating as those who are under the authority of Jesus Christ. And I feel like sometimes, sometimes we're still in the mindset that people should have more.
respect for the church? Well, they're not going to give it unless we give them a reason to be respectful of the people in the church. See, there was a time when the church had been given a great deal of respect by society, and we're not too far removed from it, to be honest. There was a time when the church had an incredible place of prominence in all of American social life. I hate to tell you, that is not the case today. That is not the world that we live in. See, there was a time when the church was the social and the moral authority from which people uh, uh, gathered their lives around. And even when its teachings were ignored, sometimes people ignore the teachings, there's no doubting that it carried a societal weight. What the church said was gospel truth, right? That is not where we're at. But see, like today, the early church, the church in which Paul is writing to Timothy here, that church, it didn't have a whole lot of respect in the community. Now, pe now maybe, maybe people enjoyed being in contact with Christians, but they didn't have a lot of weight in the community. They didn't have a lot of authority in the places in which they were entrenched. And so the church found itself in a foreign culture trying to share the good news with those lost in their own sin. But a lot of those people, they were already doing their own thing. They were off at uh, uh, the Temple of Artemis or whatever they wanted to do in Ephesus where this is written. They were kind of dabbling in their own stuff. And, and really, Paul is saying, this is how you begin to earn respect in your community. This is how you earn the right to speak to other people. This is how you earn the right for them to listen to you and to actually take what you say as important. These are the ways that you must live as a leader or as a representative of Christ. See, part of that reason, part of that reason why the church right now has lost its place of prominence and its place of respect and its place of understanding in the community is because we have placed people in leadership that have been poor representatives of who Christ is supposed to be. There are other factors at play, but I, I think that we have placed people that have a lot of talent on the brightest stages and not place the people that have the most love for God. I, I think about this kind of stuff. People that were given the respect and were touted as important evangelical voices, but they were not above reproach. And certainly not worthy of respect. Many of them couldn't check off more than a couple items on the list. I think of names like Jim Baker and Peter Popoff and Tony Alamo and, and, and a lot of these names that really soured the church by, by selling a product that appeared to be Christianity but ended up being something way, way, way different. And the world said, wow, you know, who, you know who Christians are? They're people that are just gobbling up power and money for themselves and we don't want anything to do with that. Because they were leaders that were not above reproach. And they lost the respect of a community. See, leaders that are not worthy of respect by leading lives that are consistent with the gospel that they preach, they undermine the credibility of the gospel to a world that needs to know its truth. Amen. So this is, this is Paul again, verses 14 and 15. He says, I hope, to, I hope to come to you soon, and I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. <laughs> which is the church of the living God. The pillar and the foundation of the truth. The church. The church is the pillar and the foundation of Paul as he's writing this to Timothy. To be men and women of character is a foundation for the church. He says that it is a pillar. <laughs> the church is the pillar of truth, which means when we're talking about the church, we're talking about people, which means if we, if we are the ones who are the ones who are upholding the church, that means that we must be the ones who are exuding these qualities. To be men and women of character, to be men and women above reproach, to be men and women who exhibit these sort of character qualities is a buttress to the church. It holds the church up. It keeps it standing. And so it, that is what keeps the church from crumbling is 
that we're actually living lives that reflect what Christ asked us to live and that it's not just an appearance of a life. And, and even when we're, we're towing the line of morality, we say, well, technically I didn't do anything wrong here, that we have a mind on how everything that we do is perceived by those around us. Even if you say, well, it doesn't affect me. It's not something that really hurts me. Think about what your neighbor is thinking as you go through it and then ask if it's the right thing to do. Because it's never, well, I don't want to say never, but 99% of our faith is not about what's good for me, but what's about good for my brother or my sister or my God. And that's something we got to get past. It's more than being a moral person. You can be a moral person and be a terrible person. Our minds are always focused on how we are received, how we are perceived as ambassadors of the gospel. Because here, here's really the thing. Members of the body are like little elders and deacons all over the place because people are looking at you as a representative of the body. If you claim to be a Christian, if you have been baptized as a believer into the body of the church and you advertise that, yes, I'm a Christian, guess what? You just got placed in leadership. And that's important for us to know. See, there are leaders appointed and accountable to the flock, and I, let me tell you, that responsibility is weighty. And I wonder every day if I am an appropriate example to my flock. But there is a weight that even rests on the shoulders of all of those that represent Jesus to their workplaces, to their families, to their friends. When you accept membership into the body, you're subject to the scrutiny of the world. So I ask you this question one more time. Is my life worthy of respect? Am I living a life that is above reproach? When others see me, do they see Jesus, or do they see someone who's just trying to make sure I don't mess up any of the rules? That's an important question. Because central, the very heart of our conduct, the very heart of this truth, and I think this is why Paul writes this here at the very end of this letter, not the very end of this letter, the very end of this chapter. I think Paul sums it up. He says, there's a reason why we behave this way. There's a reason why we think this way, because there is one person to whom we, uh, we pattern our very lives after, and it is he who is described in verse 16. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh. We know who he is. Jesus appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by, or, or sometimes uh, it's translated vindicated in the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. We follow one who was above reproach in all ways, and one whose mind was always, always, always on others. I think Jesus was so wrapped up in other people, he didn't even really have to think about whether he was taking the right step next. We have a great pattern to work from. Whether you are a layman in the church, and, and you're just sort of part of this body and you're, you're one of those vital organs that just sort of keeps things going or whether you're a deacon, a support in a leadership role, whether you're a member of the board, you know, or, or whether, whether, uh, whether I'm a pastor or whether you're a district superintendent or whether you're in charge of an entire church or whether you're the doggone pope of the Catholic church. It doesn't matter who you are. I mean, everyone is a representative of Christ. And it's hard to escape that if you claim him. So we pattern ourselves after the one who's given us the ultimate example of leadership. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Church, would you pray with me? God, I don't know who needed to hear this today. I, I think I did. But I just pray that these truths, God, sometimes, sometimes they can be a little pointed. I, I ask that... 
Maybe that you wouldn't take the point off of it, but God, that we would be able to digest it with open hearts. Willing spirits, and, and God, that your truth would just be so... God, I, words fail me right now. I'm... I just know that you have an incredible truth that you want to reveal to us, God, and I don't want these words to fall on idle ears. And so whatever seed, I, I'm just scattering seed this morning, Lord, and I want you to water it, and I want you to, to, to put sun on it, and I want you to, 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 in the power of your Holy Spirit, to enable it to fall on fertile soil, and God, that as a church, that, that we would take this, and that we would, be, we would be better ambassadors of you because of it. Not because I think that we're bad ambassadors of who you are, but because we can always, always take these things and grow. And so, God, grow us. May we look more like you because of the words said today. And, God, may we not take them for granted, and may we never have a spirit that says, I didn't need to hear this today, because we all need these reassurances. God, today, may we look more like you, because you have spoken to us. And plant this word deep in our hearts, and, God, as we go through our days and through our weeks, may you grow it. May you turn us into people who are better representatives of you than we were when we came in this door. May we receive you. May we find joy in you. Oh, God, we need you. We are your people. We love you. And it's in that precious name of Jesus we pray all of these things. And the whole church said together, amen. Church, you're loved. You're prayed for. And now you're dismissed. You have a wonderful Sunday. And see some of you this evening at prayer. Sounds good, brother. <laughs>